We still need to look in the Scriptures, amen? John chapter number 20, if you'd turn with me, we'll get right into them. John chapter number 20. And I'll tell you, I'm enjoying myself a whole lot more this Easter than I did last Easter. Uh, amen. I was looking at a lot of nobodies last year and uh, because of the situation we were facing, but thank God, thank God. One thing hasn't changed. A lot's changed in a year, no doubt, but one thing hasn't changed. Christ is still alive. He's still the conquering king, and he's the redeeming Savior, and uh, his gospel still goes forward. Amen. John chapter number 20. Let's stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. John chapter number 20. Beginning in verse 24, when you find your place, say amen. amen. Verse 24 says, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also, and there are also many other things that which she's, oh, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong chapter, amen? <laughs> That's still a good passage, I should preach it, amen? <laughs> I'm on the wrong side of my Bible. Okay, verse 24, I'm sorry. Verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, that's more familiar to me now, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, Thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You may be seated, and may God add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. Obviously, the morning of Jesus' resurrection, while it started out gloomy for the disciples of Christ, it dramatically shifted to a time of indescribable joy. I mean, Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain for the sins of the world, he had risen from the dead. Friday and Saturday had been dark days filled with sorrow and tears and doubts as the disciples recounted the death and funeral of their Lord. But on the third day, on that Sunday morning following the crucifixion, the funeral service turned into a festive worship service. In verses 19 and 20 of John, or John chapter number 20, the Bible says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now, can you imagine? It had to be, it had to seem like a dream. It was just too good to be true. The disciples could hardly take it in. One minute they're discouraged and they're sad and they're terribly afraid. They're traumatized because their Lord has been unjustly arrested and nailed to a cross, and now they obviously are in fear of their lives. The Jewish leaders, which had been the culprits behind the injustice, they are now the ones that they're in fear of, and they're assembling behind closed doors thinking that they're coming after them next. But then the first day of a new week came, the first day of the new dispensation of grace. It was the beginning of a new era as the result of God the Father's plan of redemption now being accomplished. Jesus had risen from the grave in great triumph as proof, the Bible says in Romans chapter number 1, that he is the Son of God, and also that his sacrifice on the cross had been accepted by the Father as the satisfactory atoning payment for our sins. What a day that first resurrection morn was. What excitement there was at seeing the empty tomb and encountering angels and then seeing Christ alive. And yet, as great as that was, by the end of that Sunday evening, there was still one disciple who was, who was still swallowed up with grief and plagued with doubts about the risen Christ. His name was Thomas. 
Many of us have grown up here in that disciple's name, referred to as Doubting Thomas. When we get to heaven, he might, he might get on to some of us and say, I didn't doubt all the time, amen, but that's how we know him. But perhaps it's unfair that he wears this title, but he was the last disciple to hold out in believing that Christ had risen from the grave, and so he did earn the title. This morning, I just want to discuss how that the resurrection of Christ is a proven fact that destroys all legitimate doubt about God and His salvation and the person of Christ and the inerrancy of Scripture and the doubt about knowing that we can be forgiven of sin. I want to tell you, doubt is the enemy of truth. It is the obstacle to belief. Doubt only fuels unbelief. And while there can be legitimate doubts, I want to tell you, God wants to settle those doubts. So we're going to see how that unbelief is inexcusable. Once presented with the truth, it's inexcusable rebellion against God because God has provided all that we need to believe in the risen Christ. I want to tell you something. Every thinking person wrestles with doubt at some point. We can all confess that. That's not just true of Christians. That's true of atheists and agnostics. I've talked to plenty of atheists and agnostics, and even they have wondered, what if we are wrong about there not being a God? What if we are wrong if there it truly is something that exists beyond this life, and we've rejected the means of salvation? And they wrestle with doubts. And yes, even thinking Christians have wondered at times, what if Christianity is not true? Now, for some believers the doubts are relatively minor and fleeting. And the consequence of having doubts is that you, if you're a believer, you're stripped of your assurance of salvation. But for unbelievers, the doubts are very serious because they stand in the way of salvation. They stand in the way of receiving forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So if there's anyone listening this morning that's struggling with doubt, no matter where you are on the spectrum of doubt, I want you to know that all of your doubts can be eliminated this very hour. To prove it, I'm going to walk you through the account or make some observations about the one who was the doubter we know was Thomas and how Christ cleared up all doubt with him. Thomas is one you could classify as a sincere doubter. What do you mean by that? Well, there are insincere doubters. There are some people who really don't want truth. I don't care how much evidence in Scripture you present to them. They're always going to find something else to to rise and ask a question about because they do not really want truth. Not everybody is a sincere doubter. If you ever encounter this kind of person, you're going to find out that when you clear up or give a response to one question, conveniently another one pops up. What about this? And what about dinosaurs? And what? Just, they just refuse. They're dishonest doubters. They refuse to accept the evidence before them that they can believe. And they seal their eternal damnation because they refuse to believe the reasonable truth that God has provided. Such people do not need more evidence to believe. They simply need to repent of their love of sin, which is standing in the way of receiving the truth. But there are some doubters that are sincere. They actually want to know the truth. Like the Christian who was plagued with honest questions and the unbeliever who genuinely wants to know, is this true? Both suffer from a lack of information, a lack of truth. They suffer from ignorance. They both simply need more substance to sink their faith into. They need the knowledge of God to clear up their doubts. Thomas, he was already a convert, but he was that kind of sincere doubter. So this story is very helpful because it reveals that the Lord can remove all doubts. Now, there are many causes of doubt that we could list, but I'm just going to point out a few that Thomas struggled with, or that actually were the source of Thomas's doubt. Let's talk about the origins of his doubt. Now, Thomas is a very colorful figure, if you haven't figured it out. We usually talk about Peter a whole lot, but Thomas is just as outspoken, I believe, as Peter was. We just have more information about Peter. But in John eleven sixteen, 16, when Jesus was about to go to Bethany near Jerusalem, to raise Lazarus from the dead, the disciples objected to the trip because they thought it was too dangerous. Jesus had been there earlier, and the Jews there had tried to kill him, and so this didn't make sense to them. And Jesus made it real clear, when you're walking in the light, when you're doing my will, you don't have to fear about fear of stumbling. 
Jesus let them know that it was okay to follow him. There's nothing to fear. And Jesus said, nevertheless, speaking of Lazarus, let us go to him. And Thomas despondently and distrustfully, he says to the Lord in John eleven sixteen, 16, he says, basically to the Lord, but all the disciples are listening, let us also go that we may die with him. In other words, Thomas totally disagrees with Jesus' words of assurance that you won't stumble if you're walking in the light, if you're in God's will. And he distrusts Jesus' judgment in this matter. He sees this as a suicide mission. Okay, it's bad enough that Lazarus is dead, but Lord, we're going to follow you, and we're going to die with him too. While Thomas was an outspoken pessimist, He should at least be commended for this. He was willing to follow Christ loyally, even if it meant they were going into a hostile situation that could result in death. Of course, just days later, he would succumb to fear and join the others in fleeing the side of Christ when Christ was arrested. But then after Jesus' resurrection, Thomas' character flaws would surface again. In John 20 and verse 25, the other disciples, they had seen the Lord. Therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. You're not convincing me dead men don't get up out of the grave. So let me say, first of all, the source, one of the sources of Thomas's doubt was that he was just a distrustful person. He was a natural pessimist and skeptic. It wasn't just Thomas's failure to be in the room when Jesus appeared that produced his doubts about the testimony of the risen Christ, but it was that coupled with his distrustful personality. He's one of the guys who, who he questions everything he sees and hears. Thomas was a conscientious, loyal, but gloomy type who did not commit himself to something lightly. He didn't take leaps of faith with his eyes closed. You can be sure that when he had previously committed his life to following Christ, he was more, he was more than 110% convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And so Jesus' death, it rattled this disciple's faith. It affected him deeply. Thus, when the reports were being made that Jesus was alive, Thomas wasn't buying into any of it. He refused to believe the news. Now, consider the facts that these reports were being made by the closest of his companions. This wasn't some internet rumor, amen? The other disciples that were testifying that they had seen the Lord personally were his closest companions. But despite the credibility and the character of his friends, He emphatically declares, except I see in his hand the print of the nails and put my finger into those nail holes and thrust my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe you. Don't you know that he was insulting the other disciples' witness and testimony? He was basically calling them liars. He says, in effect, I don't believe you. I don't trust in what you're saying. Now, listen, we're all wired differently, and so it's important to know your own flaws and weaknesses. You know, some of us are by nature by our sin nature, just negative. Isn't that true? That's where that term negative Nancy comes from. Say amen. Some people are just critical of everything. And I'm I'm saying we need to be aware of our own flaws because some of our weaknesses and our flaws can stand in the way of us believing the legitimate evidence that God has provided. Such a character flaw, if we allow it, can be an obstacle to faith and also hinder spiritual development because it will only breed unreasonable unbelief, unwarranted doubt. Another factor that produced doubt and disappointment and a refusal to believe within Thomas was the shock that he felt whenever he watched Jesus die. There were disappointed expectations, no doubt, that he experienced. And I'll tell you something, disappointment will definitely produce doubt. Even though Jesus had repeatedly told his disciples in advance that he would be crucified, it just didn't sink in with the disciples. When Thomas either saw or heard the report of just how mangled the body of Jesus was on the cross, it traumatized him. You say, how do you know that? Well, listen to the emphasis on the wounds of Christ's 
that he bore in his body that he graphically alludes to. In John 20 and verse 25, let me read it again. Thomas says, except I shall see in his hand the prints of the nails. I mean the image of the nail holes are in Thomas's mind. And put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. Evidently, the bloody holes in Jesus' hands and feet and the gaping hole in his side from the spear wound this disfigurement and the crown of thorns, all of these things, these images haunted Thomas in the days following the cross of fiction, the crucifixion, and fed his doubts. These images dominated his mind, and they shattered all of his dreams and expectations concerning Christ. He, like the others, had hope and believed that Jesus, the Messiah, would establish his kingdom at this time and redeem all of Israel. But with the nails and the hammer and the whip and the cross, all of those dreams and expectations crumbled. Now, let me make an application right here. Whenever we face deep disappointment and shock because of some unexpected tragedy or unanswered prayer or something doesn't go the way we want it to in life, we too become vulnerable to our doubts. Some of us begin to think, if God is love, then why did this happen? If God is in control, why didn't he intervene? And all of a sudden, disappointments begin to cause us to spiral downward in depression and faithlessness. Many of the atheists that I have talked to in, in witnessing have always pointed to some disappointment in their past as to why they refuse to believe in God. I want to tell you something. Thomas's disappointment caused him to say, I will not believe. There's another thing that caused Thomas to stumble at the truth that day, and that was the difficulty of understanding God's, God's ways and God's work. Friend, God's ways are not our ways. And just because you can't understand everything that God is doing does not mean that what he's doing isn't, isn't occurring Thomas lacked understanding with regard to what God was doing and accomplishing through Jesus' departure, through his death. On the night before the crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples that he was going away to prepare a place for them and that he would come again to take them to be with them. And he told them that they knew where he was going and they knew the way to get there. But guess what? Thomas couldn't sit there. He's thinking, I, 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 I'm doubting what you're saying. I don't understand all this metaphysical stuff. And so... Thomas wasn't the type to keep quiet, and he blurts out in John 14, 5, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. The Lord then said, you know the way. Thomas says, no, we don't. And how can we know the way? You're going to leave us. You're our leader. How can we know the way to the Father's kingdom? Now, Thomas's question arises out of doubts and uncertainty and sorrow and all these things mixed together, and I would not chide Thomas for what he is asking. But I'm actually thankful, to tell you the truth, that he asked the question because we get one of the greatest responses from the Lord out of his question, don't we? In John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus says, Thomas, you do know the way. I'm the way. If we put ourselves into that situation with all of the confused emotions of that night and with the disciples' very limited insight into Jesus' death and resurrection, you can start to sympathize with Thomas's confusion, can't you? He lacked understanding, and thus his ignorance led to doubt. In John 20 and verse number 9, they all were lacking understanding. The Bible says, for as yet they knew not the Scripture. While the Scripture was available, they didn't understand it that he must rise again from the dead. None of them understood why Jesus had to die, let alone were they looking for the resurrection. In Luke 24 and verse 25, Jesus said to the two disciples that were headed to, the, to Emmaus, on, their, on, on that road to Emmaus when he appeared to them, he said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All of this has already been foretold in your Old Testament. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In other words, should he not have had to die and suffer for sins before he 
Before the crown, there has to be a cross. Before he enters into the glory of his kingdom, there had to be the suffering. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, the Bible says, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Here, here's the point. Many of our doubts stem from the same cause. We do not know the scriptures. If you study this Bible, you'll find that God will clear up the doubts. The people that I deal with say, I just can't believe there's not enough evidence don't even know the Bible. They've never even read the Gospels. You begin to really try to push someone into why they don't want to receive the Gospel. Many times, if it's not because of a love of sin, it's just because they don't know the Scriptures and they won't take the time to read the book. They're dishonest doubters. They don't want the truth. But those who want the truth will find the truth. In verse 24, we see another source of Thomas's doubt. In verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them. With who? The other disciples when Jesus came. He was missing from that first assembly of believers on that resurrection morning, so he was disconnected from fellow believers. Thomas was not with the other disciples when Jesus appeared to them. He had forsaken, let me say it this way, he had forsaken the assembly. <laughs> now, to be fair, I don't want to criticize Thomas because we don't know for certain while he was absent. However, we can make this observation. He sure missed out on the blessing of Christ's presence during that Sunday night assembly. And as a result of his not being with the other believers, he suffered longer spiritually than he would have if he had been in the fellowship Perhaps, though, Thomas wasn't there in that first assembly on that resurrection morn with the other believers because he was suffering from depression. Usually, one of the last things depressed people want around them when they're depressed is other people. Depression drives you into isolation. So maybe Thomas wandered off in despair after Christ was crucified to brood over his failure and fleeing the Lord's side and then ponder all that he feels like he has lost and believed that may have been a lie. And then to add to his misery, when he finally did see the other disciples, what did they say? They began to rejoice and talk about how they had seen the risen Lord. Now, let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you missed church because you were depressed and doubting and struggling, and then when you do come back, we all tell you, boy, you missed a blessing. It was the greatest worship service we ever experienced. Greatest service in history. You know what your response would be? Whatever, shut up. <laughs> when your faith and spirituality aren't what they should be, now listen, the spiritual enthusiasm and excitement of others begins to irritate you. Can I get a witness? You've been there. Say amen. But you hear me. Christians, we need the witness and fellowship and exhortation of other believers to flourish in our faith, especially when our faith begins to waver. God designed you a unique, essential part of the body to function best with the body. Whenever we separate ourselves from the fellowship, we become vulnerable to doubts and the attack of despair and everything else the devil can throw at us. And isn't it interesting Jesus didn't appear to Thomas when he was by himself. Jesus appeared to Thomas not during the week, but whenever he went back to the assembly eight days later. The Lord was teaching us in a demonstrable way our need for the body. He never intends for us to separate ourselves from the body. He has united us together with the church. It is his sovereign plan for us to learn and grow together and worship him as one and have all things in common. Now, if you're here today and you have doubts, whatever the source of them might be, I know we haven't covered all the sources of doubts, but regardless, the solution is the same. The answer to the problem of doubt is found in the fact that there was a resurrected, a bodily, a physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, if that one event is true, then even though you may not understand everything, life and death now have purpose, and the future offers hope, if with Thomas you will bow your knee and confess Jesus to be your Lord and God, God will deliver you from those doubts and those fears. And it all, listen, all the answers to the questions are settled in the reality of the risen Christ. What was it that destroyed Thomas's doubts? 
the risen Christ. In verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Now the Lord had to say, Peace be unto you, because they were scared to death when he appeared in their midst. Amen. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither, thy hand, reach, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Sounds like somebody had been listening to Thomas. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. You know, it's not good enough just to know that Jesus is God. You're going you're gonna to find that out sooner or later. That's the reality. Jesus is God. And if you want salvation, you've got to receive him as Lord. He's Lord and God. What condescension by Christ, though. Here the omnipotent Lord of glory, risen from the dead, miraculously appears, offering a struggling doubter a personal inspection of the marks of his crucifixion. The invitation to Thomas was to touch his nail-pierced hands and the, the sword that pierced, or the hole in his side where the sword had pierced him. But there was no need for Thomas. Thomas didn't follow through with that request. Why? Because he realized that he had been unbelieving when he should not have been unbelieving. He was overcome and overcome with remorse and repentance. And in humility, love, and devotion, he falls to his knees, and all he can say is, My Lord and my God. In that moment, all of Thomas's doubts died with the realization that Jesus was alive. Secondly, let me talk to you about the overcoming of doubt. You see, the Lord's not going to appear to us physically. He has ascended. In fact, in verse 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. But watch this. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. In other words, he's talking about you and I. The Lord knew he was soon to arise, and so he's not going to be walking on this earth physically anymore. So what happens to us that have doubts? Is there sufficient evidence to believe reasonably in the risen Lord? Let me tell you, yes, there is. Let me talk about the reality of the resurrection. Jesus is alive. And if you doubt it, I want you to consider a few of these evidences, and I'm going to have to move through them pretty quickly. But in John 20 and verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Evidence number one is the empty tomb. This is the smoking gun for the critic. In fact, listen to me carefully. I know people on the internet want to say, oh, we don't know if Jesus was even a real person anymore. Let me tell you, there's more historical evidence that Jesus was more real than you. He was a literal figure. And here's what people don't want to be honest about. But if you do your homework, you'll find out that even the skeptics of Christ, we're talking about the real authoritative people who write because they do research. All of them will concede this. While they may not admit that Jesus is the Son of God, they all will concede that Jesus died and that the grave was empty on that third day. They all will concede that. Listen, even Josephus and many other historical writers who were not Christians testified that that grave was empty. There are a lot of theories they tried to make up to try to explain it away. But my friend, you still, listen, if you don't believe in Christ here today, you still got a problem. Where did the body go? You got a problem you need to deal with. I don't know if there's a difference between Buddha and, and Muhammad and Jesus. What if they're all the same? They're not the same. They're still in the grave, my friend. You can visit their grave sites. I've been to Israel. They're still looking for a body, still haven't found one. They're going to find one one day because he's going to come back riding on a white horse. Let me give you another evidence in verses 6 and 7. Then come a Simon Peter following him. And went to the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes. He seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped. Notice it's wrapped together. It's the picture of it still being in its form in a place by itself. The second evidence is the evidence of the grave clothes. 
The presence of the grave clothes and the state they were left in proved that the body of Jesus was not stolen. If grave robbers had a, somehow they were able to sneak past the Roman soldiers and move the stone without them being aware of it and snuck into the grave, they would have taken the body, grave clothes and all. Thieves get in and get out. Can I get a witness? But guess what? The grave clothes were still lying in the tomb. And as ludicrous as it is, suppose the grave robbers stole the body, and for some strange reason they weren't scared of being caught by Roman soldiers, and they took the time to strip the corpse of Jesus before scurrying away. Then the clothes would have been strewn all over the tomb. But Peter and John saw those linen wrappings left in an orderly fashion. The cloth that had covered the face of Jesus was still folded and rested in a place by itself. And the linen strips that had been wound around Jesus' body, they still retained the shape of his body. Because of the spices, uh, scholars have told us that, it, that that ointment would have set in and those grave clothes, and those grave clothes would have looked like a cast or a cocoon. Jesus' body literally passed through those grave clothes. It's clear the evidence of the undisturbed grave clothes show that Jesus had risen from the dead. But there's another evidence, and that's the eyewitness accounts of the risen Savior. John lists four appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. He appears first to Mary Magdalene in John chapter number 20, verses 11 through 18, then to the disciples minus Thomas in verses 19 through 23, then to the disciples including Thomas in verses 24 through 31, and then to seven of the disciples by the Sea of Galilee, chapter 21, verses 1 through 25. The Apostle Paul mentions several other appearances. He, he refers to one appearance that occurred to James, then to Peter or Cephas, and then to himself, to the apostles. And then on one account, Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one time after his resurrection. Now, now, let's think logically. If there had only been one eyewitness of the risen Savior, no would have believed the report. If there had only been two witnesses, people would have assumed they were lying and covering for each other. But Christ appeared for 40 days after his resurrection to hundreds of people, proving he was alive and well. There's another evidence, and that's the emboldening of Jesus' disciples. As we've already seen, John calls attention to the fact that none of Jesus' disciples were expecting him to rise from the grave. In verses 2 and 15, Mary Magdalene had thought that someone had taken Jesus' body. In verse 19, the disciples were fearful and confused, hiding behind closed doors. In verse 25, Thomas is depressed and doubting, but all of these Followers of Christ were miraculously transformed into the bold witnesses of the book of Acts because they had become or became convinced that Jesus was alive. Had they have not seen the risen Lord, they would not have become the powerful witnesses of the gospel that they became. They knew what they saw with their own eyes and heard with their own ears and handled, as John would say in 1 John chapter number 1, handled with their own hands. They were so convinced that the resurrection was true that many of them went on to a martyr's death. And as I've said time and time again, you don't die for a lie. These disciples were willing to die the most heinous of deaths because they had been emboldened by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me give you another evidence, and that's the experience of every transformed believer. I had a man one time who was skeptical about Christ and the reality of Christ and as being the Son of God and His resurrection. He said, do you really believe what you're preaching? I said, do you really think I'd three times a week and even in my home deceive my children with some myth or fairy tale? What kind of cruel person would that be? I believe this. I'll die on this truth. I know what Christ has done for me personally. You can't, listen, you can't convince me no otherwise. I know what he's done in my life. I know he's real. And I'm so glad that Jesus doesn't limit his transforming power to only those who were there to see him alive physically after his resurrection during those 40 days. 
Where would that leave all of us, by the way? Instead, he continues, though, to reveal himself to anyone who would genuinely believe the gospel message concerning him. Verse 29, let me read it again. Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Though we don't see Jesus physically today, though we can't touch him, his resurrection appearances are just as real to those of us who seek him sincerely those of us who listen to him speak through his scriptures, and we place our faith in him, and he and the Father have come to take up their residence with us. Can I get a witness? One of the greatest proofs of the resurrection is a changed life resulting from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you explain drunkards wanting to give up the bottle, and addicts wanting to lay down the needle, and, and prostitutes wanting to, to become uh, pure and give themselves solely to a husband or to a wife, and this just this, this, the moral person conceding that they are a sinner in need of God's grace and placing their trust only in Christ. How do you explain these transformed lives without the reality of Christ? A spirit-filled life testifies of the resurrected Christ. And I want to say if you're ultimately looking for something other than the record of God's Word, then you're wasting your time. What we have recorded in the Bible is more than sufficient to rest your faith upon. John 20 and verse number 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The record of Scripture is sufficient. If it will not convince you, listen, I know it will convince you if you'll receive it honestly and trust what God is saying, because God's Word is life. And within God's Word is the power of God. And there's nothing more adequate or necessary. Nothing beyond the Word of God will sustain or birth faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There is nothing more that you need. The Word of God supports a reasonable, intelligent faith that Jesus Christ is the risen Savior, the one foretold of and prom promised by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures and now declared to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. So that leaves us with the opportunity of doubt. Doubt has only two possibilities with regard to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Doubt will either leave you in unbelief and harden you and cause you to stumble at the God, the true God of creation who has created us and revealed himself in the person of Christ. You can allow doubts to cause you just to keep kicking the can of truth down the road, putting it off, looking for other alternatives, and ultimately end up in hell. Or you can walk through the door of doubt and bow yourself like Thomas before the risen Savior and take your doubts and place them before his feet and say, Lord, show me, reveal to me your truth. And I guarantee if you'll do that, if you'll come hungering and thirsting after him, God will reveal himself to you. God will save you. He graciously affords us the opportunity today to join Thomas in believing worship, proclaiming by faith that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. And you've got to be able to say, my Lord and my God. A story is told of an old African Muslim who became a Christian. His friends asked, why in the world would you become a Christian? We've always been Muslims. He answered, well, it's like this, fellas. Suppose you were going down the road and suddenly the, for the road forked in two directions and you had doubts about which way to go. And there at the fork were two men, one dead and one alive. Who would you ask which way to go? I want to tell you something. Christ is alive. If I'm going to listen to anybody, I'm going to listen to the one who came back from the dead, not the one who's disappeared, told me what to do to be part of the cosmos or evolution or uh, be grafted into nirvana or attain some stairway to heaven. I, I'm not listening to men who've died and never been seen again. I'll listen to the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And he said that he would die, and on the third day he'd be raised again, and he pulled it off. I, I'll, I'll trust in the living one. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. As the pianist comes to the piano to